My name is Brandon Dixon. I am a security engineer at G2. And you'll notice from the, uh, the actual slide title that it's, uh, I named it Carrier Pigeon. This is a project that I started um, as a joke uh, two years ago. There I wanted to annoy a friend, and the, the carrier pigeon name is more of a, this is a, a, de a delivery method, so to speak. It's not an actual exploit. It's not me packing headers, nothing like that, nothing adjusting the actual SMS message. It's using the SMS implementation as a vector to deliver malicious links, uh, possible malicious code, uh, spam, and things along those lines. So two things I'm going to be talking about. Uh, one is, is abusing an the short mail implementation that is offered by the carriers, and the second one is going to be um, bonding XMPP names with legacy instant messaging clients to actually reach out to phones. So starting with the short mail, um, the second you have an account or some service with uh, your mobile provider, your number is automatically associated with an email address. Uh, this email address automatically turns you into a victim. Um, you know, all you have to have is text messaging enabled. The, when somebody actually has your number and the carrier that you belong to, they can send a message to that, to that number, that address, and the message will make it there without a problem. Um, it's received as a text message, not as an email, so it shows up in your inbox. And um, cost, cost equivalent is that it's uh, standard to a regular text message. So right away, you know, one of the biggest problems with this is that it's enabled by default. The second you sign up for service, you have this enabled whether you know it or not. And one of the things I've noticed is that when you're filling out the application or whatever it is to, to actually get your service signed up, they don't sit there and tell you. They don't go, oh, by the way, we, we've enabled something by default. You may not necessarily want, but if somebody starts to abuse it, we're going to charge you for it. So kind of attacking short mail, you have the uh, conventional spamming techniques that are already out there today. Uh, you have the mass mailers, which, you know, email, you get flooded, you get in spam all the time. So the only thing that, that spammers and mass mailers have to do is actually change the target list in which gets inputted into these mass mailers. So uh, I'll get more on that later about actually creating those actual victim lists. So another thing that uh, spamming technique that you can use with this uh, short mail attack is that you can actually spoof the source address. Uh, from some of the carriers that I have talked to, they don't actually concern themselves with the source because they're more concerned with the content, uh, which makes sense. But at the same time, an average user getting a message from, you know, president at the White House or, you know, whoever, it's, you know, if, if it does it, if it looks real, then they're more than likely going to believe it. So it adds another uh, ability to actually do phishing and things along those lines. It's another attack vector. So the carrier can be identified by services online. It's completely scriptable. And that kind of goes hand in hand with generating these uh, victim lists in that you can actually go to several sites, these form-based sites, write a, write a parser to go through the site, and input the, uh, the actual user's number and, and fairly accurately generate a list of all the victim numbers that you want and the you know, respective carriers they're associated to. So some of the limitations uh, with this attack is anything past 160 characters may be dropped, and this depends on the carrier. Uh, I've noticed that some carriers will do the truncating for you and they'll send the, the, you know, the 10, 15 messages uh, based on the, the length of the actual email you send, while other ones just drop right past 160. So the other part is the carrier must properly be identified for the message to go through, which is kind of common sense. If, if you're sending a message to a number that doesn't exist on that proper carrier, then it's not going to make it. And as same way with, with, with uh, SMS, there's no delivery confirmation. Uh, there's no reliable means of expecting that message that, to know that it made it through to the actual user itself. So overall, why is this bad? Uh, an incoming text is a charge to a user. Uh, whether they want it or not, it's owned by default. Um, you can send the short mail from any client. So like I said, it goes back to the standard spamming techniques and mass mailers in that nothing changes for them. Nothing changes if, if you're, you got an ex-boyfriend, ex-girlfriend, whatever, wants to keep on sending you these messages. They can instantly do it right from their standard mail client. So all of this, of course, is, is a problem because it's turned on by default, and most people don't even realize it. So the, the carriers offer limited methods to, uh, to stopping the attack. Um, 
by default. And what I mean by that is that the carriers give you the ability through some web interfaces to actually block 10 to 15 domains, block certain emails, block certain numbers. The problem with that is, is that you know, I can generate a random email um, with a domain name of 30 characters that's random every single time, and it's going to make it through. And when I did my initial testing, um, all the messages were different, obviously because it's coming from a different source. So you block 10 to 15 addresses, it doesn't matter because I can generate 10 to 15 in, in five seconds without a problem. So that's some of the stuff they offer by default, and the other information is just not clear. Um, I actually got to talk with some of the carriers, and they, they, they told me certain things, you know, yeah, we do have this, this available, but, you know, the information to actually find that readily available to the user was uh, fairly difficult. It was kind of, you know, obfuscated within all the other things that they offer. So some of the carrier capabilities that I did discover, um, and actually in coordination with the, the DEF CON talk, they put me through through Sprint and Verizon and, and some other carriers, and I was able to speak with them to see what protection measures they had in place, and they couldn't tell me everything about, you know, obviously about their infrastructure, but they could tell me enough that there was some protection for the user. So obviously what I said before is that users can block certain domains or completely shut the feature off, uh, depending on the carrier. Um, throttling and rate limiting are, are in place uh, actually at the carrier level, which is it's not exactly clear how that's implemented because they couldn't talk about their infrastructure. But um, doing my testing, I could see that messages would get queued up. Some of them would be dropped depending on the rate that I sent them. Um, another carrier, a few carriers I've heard of allow, actually, allow you to actually alias your short mail account so that you're no longer exposing your number and your carrier. Which is, uh, which is great, but that doesn't, it's not a feature that's available for all carriers. So um, kind of the trend that I've noticed is that carriers implement some sort of protection, but it's not all the same. Some do it better than others, some offer this, some offer that, but it's never, you know, 100%. So fixing the issue, um, the feature should be easily adjusted by the user. And what I mean by that is it just, should just be turned off by default. There's no reason why that should be on right away. Um, but part of actually turning that off is, is now the business end of it in that it's been on for who knows how long. People are used to it. And I've actually you know, met people that legitimately use the service. Uh, and shutting that off now um, would just cause a lot of issues and forcing people to actually go back, turn it back on. It, it's just a, it's got to be analyzed from a business perspective and they have to ensure that, you know, when they do this or if they're going to do it, is it worth the actual, is it worth it to actually go and do it? So one of the other things that I, um, that I noticed given throughout the carriers was that more power should be given to block uh, unwanted messages by default. And, and what I mean by that is that some of these carriers, like I said, 10 to 15 and that's it. And the, the rest of it you actually have to go to the carrier, deal with them directly and say, hey, I got a special case, you know, my wife is going crazy. She won't stop emailing me. You know, I, I can't. I keep on getting these messages, I, and it's you know, or I keep on getting the spam. And you actually have to go with them and deal with it by uh, by dealing with the actual carrier. It's this one-off case. So, um, so, moving on to the 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 next part of this, um, the XMPP and Jabber aspect of it. Uh, kind of put a few things on here that that kind of covers XMPP and Jabber. Uh, that are of interest for what I'm going to be talking about next. The communications are done through XML. Um, setting up your own server is extremely easy. Uh, there's multiple options for different platforms. Uh, allows for bonding to legacy chat implementations. And what's meant by legacy is that uh, you're actually uh, things such as AOL, Yahoo, things along those lines that aren't using XML, uh, they're considered legacy. So you have uh, control of the message flow. There's actually no rate uh, limiting on your own server if you set up your own local XMPP server. So um, right now there's, there's this internet to mobile communications. There's Google Talk, there's Yahoo, AIM, MSN in some areas. So you can input a user's phone number, you know, as long as you know it, and uh, they're now considered a contact within your list. You can, you can send a message to them. It's going to make it to their phone. It's up to them whether or not they want to respond. So uh, messages get sent in the form of an SMS. So what's new? Um, obviously, this is nothing new. Google forces, you know, some of these implementations have been done correctly, 
Uh, Google for one forces a user to respond after a chat's initiated. If there's no response after a few messages, you have no more talk with that person until they respond later on. Uh, Yahoo also forces a user to respond after a chat is initiated, and they actually perform some throttling in place, whereas Google doesn't. So AOL, on the other hand, does not force a user to respond back once a chat is initiated, uh, but they do do some throttling, which is easily bypassed. So moving on to abuse AOL, the rate limiting is imposed when sending messages too fast. Um, you can go through their fat client and actually just pick somebody and just keep on sending messages. Eventually it's going to tell you that, hey, you're sending too much too fast, stop. So that's easily handled by putting a delay. You know, this can all be done programmatically. You put a delay in your program to actually slow it down a little bit. So you're still sending your messages, but you're getting past their, uh, their throttling and rate limiting. So one of the interesting things I've noticed uh, compared to short mail was that messages past 160 characters are split into multiple messages and not dropped. So one message uh, has a 2,000 byte max, uh, and that's equivalent to 13 messages. So going back to this um, rate limiting imposed, I can send one message and have it effectively turn into 13 messages on somebody's phone, which is great because then I can send five messages. I still haven't hit the throttle yet, and they've just got a whole lot more messages. So one of the things that I noticed um, quite recently, and you know, like I said, I started this a long time ago, probably two years back, and it was nothing more than a joke. Um, I've noticed that you must make, you must accept the actual user who is uh, sending you a message um, when you're on your mobile device now. Before, from my testing, it was, I could send messages to anybody and my, my messages would come right back up. But it appears that AOL has actually taken some steps to, to further and strengthen this by forcing you to now accept any person that is new uh, within your mobile device. Um, you have to accept communications with them. They, uh, by default now, they, they send you a message like you can easily block this, you can do anything you want. They offer a lot more options, but the problem still remains that if you accept it, you're going to keep on getting messages from that person if they've already kept on sending them. So um, as I mentioned before, abuse can be done programmatically. And now we move kind of into um, the XMPP and Jabber Transports, which brings the XMPP and the legacy services together. So a transport in itself is a bolt-on service for, for a Jabber server. Um, there's transports for Yahoo, MSN, AOL, um, all different types. So it shows up in the service directory for the hosted Jabber domain. Um, users can bond to these, you know, quote-unquote legacy services uh, with their Jabber name to an AOL name. So what happens is that they log in with their Jabber account and they can see all their AOL contacts. Um, to give an example, the user looks like AOL contact at myjabber.com, where myjabber.com is the actual XMPP server. And the AOL contact is somebody that you would actually be sending a message to on your contact list. So the Jabber name can bond to multiple AOL names. Each must be in a different transport. And there are plenty of public transports available. So uh, one of the benefits that I had doing all this testing was that a lot of overseas, a lot of places in Europe and other countries openly have public uh, transports available that you can connect to and bond your names to. So when I was doing my testing, and there was no way I was doing it from you know my local box. It was always from Brazil or Norway, or the Czech Republic, and those you know they're getting hits all the time. So more than likely they're not keeping logs. More than likely they don't care who goes on their server. So it's a it's just another way to obfuscate your traffic and another loop. Um, that you can push all your messages through. So now kind of tying everything together, um, phones and Jabber, you can have an internal Jabber server set up with an AIM transport service. This could be local or you could use, like I said, one of the public transports. You bond your uh, Jabber account with your AOL account and you send messages to the phone using your internal Jabber account or your just whatever, your public Jabber account. The connection, bonding, and authorization can be done programmatically. So you don't actually have to have a fat client available to you. There are some messengers that actually do this. Um, PSI is one of them. But I, I quickly realized that using a fat client just to bond my name was going to be pointless, and it was better to actually go find out how to do this programmatically. So the, the XMPP spec is readily available. They tell you how to do it. They have the code there. All you have to do is send the messages to the right server. It consumes it. does everything you need it to do. So now moving on and abusing phones with all of this, 
uh, you can effectively generate a phone list. You, you have a, whatever number you want. Um, when I was doing my initial testing, I generated numbers for my local area codes uh, for both the 443 and the 410 to have everybody's number, whether they were a cell phone or not, in that list. Um, I then need to generate an AOL account list, and you must own these. Uh, I'm sure there's plenty of ways out there to get those. Um, you can read through the list and send one giant message per number. So effectively, I'm reading in each number and sending one message that may be equivalent to 13 messages. And what that does is it bypasses the rate limiting, because there is none on XMPP, so I keep on going, scrolling through all my numbers. And then AOL is never going to push any throttling because I'm never sending more than five messages to the end user. So when I did my testing uh, between two XMPP services, I was able to send 1,000 messages per second. Obviously, um, you know, the, there is the potential that you could overload some networks and whatnot, but... I mean, that, that was put no load on my server at all. The messages went through without, uh, without a problem. So um, you can also send multiple messages to one number. Uh, but like I said, you've got to add that delay in there to avoid any uh, throttling on AOL's end. So the limitations, obviously AOL is a single uh, point of failure. You know, the public transports, there's, there's plenty of them out there that you can bond to. Um, rate limiting is a pain to deal with. The phone carriers seem to queue up messages. They have limited bandwidth on the channels. So some messages could be dropped, in my experience, that it, depending on how you send them, they will be dropped in some cases. And AOL provides uh, support to combat against these spam and allows users to block these messages now. So why is this bad? Um, you can send messages at a high rate of speed. Some transports have support for SOX proxies, such as Tor. So you can push all your traffic and messaging through Tor and be completely anonymous. Uh, the public transports are often found in other countries with a large user base. It's good for hiding. And all attacks can be done programmatically without interaction. So fixing the problem, AOL has done a pretty good job so far, but they kind of need to, to push their implementation a little bit better and force it so they, they kind of fall in along uh, Yahoo and Google and that you have the user has to respond back before any chats can actually uh, continue. Um, like I said, the protection's gotten better since I began testing. Um, you know, they had uh, AOL has two servers, Oscar and Talk, and the Talk servers no longer appear to support the internet to mobile communications. I don't know why that was shut off, but coincidentally, I noticed this when I was doing a month-long testing uh, of a couple friends. So I don't know if I was attributed to that, but it's definitely shut off now, and I still check it every now and then. So bringing everything back full circle, why does this all matter? Um, the user is at risk with limited ways to fight against the attack. It depends on the vendor. Um, in this case, it's the cell carriers and AOL. Um, and the cellular networks are, are potentially at risk for targeted attacks that could, uh, that could affect their services. Um, time is shown that vendors are fixing things, and that's, you know, that's all that we're concerned about. And I uh, hope that it can only get better and protect the user. So I know I have a demo marked down on here, and uh, I think you guys are going to hate me, but unfortunately, I've had having issues um, actually working the demo. So... I can't explain what it was doing at one point in time before I broke it. The uh, web application eliminated dependencies within the libraries. So all this was done on Linux um, using the Jabber and XMPP libraries. So one of the things I wanted to do with the web application was abstract all that and basically have it so that any person anywhere could just do these attacks. So um, the web application itself could be easily made into a framework can be accessed anywhere. And the proof of concept that I had working allowed for uh, bonding of the names, uh, the, the XMPP names to the legacy services, sending messages through a choice of transports, which would be pulled down real time, sending spoof short mail messages, identifying public transports, and then uh, obviously more could be added. So here's my contact information. Like I said, if you guys have any questions, feel free to, to grab me as I'm leaving or, or if you see me at the con. And that's it.